Awesome. Thanks. Can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. Use this to quiet me down a little bit so that it makes it more palatable. So I'm not as loud as normal. Does that does that work? Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having us out here today. Obviously, uh, y'all probably pretty familiar with me and my brother. Of course, um, I'm Matt. My brother's Tim. Yep. And and we we love Japanese maples. We love plants that provide a lot of color. And that's sort of what we're going to be talking about today um, with some. Uh, Obviously, a very Japanese maple centric talk with lots of other plants added in as well. So, if you come see us a lot, don't worry. We've got a different presentation than Open House. If you've got a different presentation than you're doing five or six more talks in uh, North, Carolina. North Carolina this year. So, don't worry. You've got something original and new. Uh, we, we didn't give you a repeat performance here. You get something different. One of the things we're definitely talking about today is the color explosion. This is actually my parents' yard. Many of y'all may have been there. Um, I know the conference study was just there. Some people have been here for our open house. And uh, just look at the yard. You see yet reds, greens, yellow. Yellow makes all of it tied together and, and, and pop for sure. So, you know, we, you've probably seen this picture. You're familiar with our place. Color explosions, where we get those are from combinations and contrast and using trees and other plants in the garden that pair with that and really bring those colors out. Um, we love Japanese maples, but I love the color and the flash of it as well. One of my favorite gardens is Kaboto Gardens because it combines that Japanese style gardening with the flash of American plants. So you get like a really cool, you know, the explosive eye-catching kind of stuff. And that's and a little bit what we'll kind of talk about here today too. And that's what, we're, what we tried to tie in at my parents' home. Um, you'll see this is an Aspromatum uh, dissectum Anaba Shadari up here, that weeping red cascading lace leaf, and we paired it with that golden sedum. It One of those basic color combinations for pairing, but it really brings the eye to it. I mean, you know, accentuating uh, two of your most common things. I mean, these are things everybody has in their garden, but putting them together, it really makes that pop, especially in early spring when they play off each other. And while we're talking about color explosion, this may be a Japanese maple paired with one of the more simple plants. We're going to be talking about pairing lots of other Japanese maples with each other to really provide that color explosion as well, and other neat rare plants that really provide a lot of color in the garden. So you, if you follow us on Facebook, you're probably familiar with our 10 at 10 we've been doing. Uh, we, we've been listing 10 new trees every Tuesday at 10, which has been kind of our, our uh, lazy man's way of not putting uh, 500 new trees on the website all at once. We're like, do you want all those descriptions at once? No. It, it, I'd like to say we're like really smart marketing people. But the truth <laughs> is we're like, yeah, that's a lot. Man, what if we just did 10 a week? That'd make more sense, wouldn't it? And we've had a huge response. It's been really popular. But we list 10 new trees on Mr. Maple every Tuesday at 10. Uh, some of our most popular releases, um, Hot Blonde here, uh, beautiful tree. This, this is a tree, I got extra credit. I, I named this tree after my wife, so <laughs> I'm benefited by the name. There's a beautiful woman that goes along with it that loves me very much, and it can mean anybody you need. Yeah, and uh, this was found as a chance seedling in Chapel Hill off an of Acer Olive Um The only other yellow that I know of in that garden is actually a Shirasolanum ari. Um, so it may actually be an Olive Rainum X Shirasolanum, um, but we, we do a lot of selecting in Acer Olivierinum. Uh, we love the species because it's, it's essentially, it looks just like a Japanese maple. This is a Chinese maple, so it's in section palmata. It's a closely related cousin to the Japanese maple, and for most people they're going to look at that and go, oh, looks like a Japanese maple to me. But the Acer Olivierinum is a little bit more heat tolerant, so we can push zones a little bit further with this. So by making newer selections in some of these other species, this grafts onto the same understock that we graft all of our Japanese maples on. It's actually, after we fell in love with this tree, it's probably the closest we've ever come to patenting a tree. We've, we've never patented a, a Japanese maple, but we really, really thought about this one for a long time because it's, it's super durable, it's spring color is amazing, and the fall color was one of the best we've ever seen too. And it's a very good grower. And so it's not something that sits around. It makes a, a nice tree very quickly, especially in the nursery setting. Um, this is the summer flushes on it in the nursery, and you notice the sort of orangish new growth, that red border, kind of reminiscent of Shirasawa Um But this tree is very durable and a strong grower for sure. Again, there's some more of that orange new growth. So intensely bright yellow early spring. You know, this tree should be right around 15 feet in that 10 year kind of period. We try to listen, we'll talk a lot about different heights too. And uh, I always tell us in each of our presentations, but we always try to see a time frame for heights. You'll actually see a picture in here. You might have seen this picture in some other presentations, but it's the best picture I'm ever going to take in my life. We have a picture of a 600-year-old Japanese maple in Japan. And one of the reasons we always give a time frame, because people say, 
what's the max size this is going to get? And, and we always try to emphasize that they're going to outlive us all. Like, what, what was maturity on that 600-year-old tree? Like, 200 years old? I don't, I don't know what maturity was for this tree, but it, it certainly continued to grow with age. So we try to go with uh, the most honest answer we can, which is in a 15-year period, this is kind of what you should expect on the size. Yeah, and to touch on the naming of this again, the original name we put on this was actually Golden Ticket. And uh, we were informed Which by, we didn't like as much. We didn't like as much. We were informed by Tom Rainey that he had a, a trademark on a, a plant called Golden Ticket. And we said, oh, okay, we'll come up with another name. And, and then Matt decided to name it after his wife. So, yeah, that was <laughs> Extra credit there quickly. So this was actually the best fall color I've ever seen on a maple in our greenhouses, too. Yeah. One of the reasons we really thought about patenting this one for a while, I just don't like patenting plants because we do so many plants that... For us, we, we, a lot for us is a thousand of something. We don't plan on doing 50,000 of something, but uh, awesome colors. This color actually held on. You see the other trees around it are out of leaf. This picture was taken probably early December. I had amazing fall color this bright from October all the way through November, late into December mid, for us. Mid-October to mid-December. I mean, it was yeah. just, it was striking. Everyone that came into the nursery, uh, they would say, I want that plant. And we only got a few. We weren't, <laughs> we, we weren't letting letting go of our our three gallon crop at that moment because we needed to graft off of those and our other stock plants we've been evaluating. We've been watching this tree for about seven years now. Seven to eight years. What we try to do too when evaluating, we'll, we'll talk about this too, but you know, we introduce some plants. We always try to do, uh, evaluate anything for at least six to seven years, get it in different conditions. You know, we'll send it to New Jersey, we'll send it to Texas, we'll send it to Oregon, and then we'll take notes on what it's doing in every environment, and then we'll say, how is this? What's the five closest things to this? And with something like Oliviarum, that's easy because there's no selections in Oliviarum yet. But you know, with most Japanese maples, we say, what's the five closest things to this? And then you have to answer, is it better than or different than that in, in a good way before you want to put it out there? And that's kind of our evaluation process for things with, like that. With the thousand cultivars too, we're very good at evaluating and saying, hey, this is close to this. Hey, this is close to this. This doesn't need to be introduced because it's just like this. The last thing we need is another tree that looks just like another one out there with a different name. And so we're very picky in particular about that. And uh, the trees we often release through us we call the Area 51 collection. And y'all may have heard of that. We say their plants are out of this world. Um, but the, the, now you were talking about the reason the truth why that came about is we would both be at presentations, you know, 10 years ago, and we're, we're still a tiny nursery, but when we were smaller than we are now, uh, we'd be on the road and dad would sell the one we had and it was the only one and it was the first hot one and we were looking for it and dad said hey somebody came by and bought a tree today and i'm like oh no and then we just rush out to find out what's missing and uh, you know he was super proud he made a sale and we'd be like dad that was only one of that so quickly it kind of became a joke with a lot of our customers they're like i want that area 51 back there where you're hiding all the good stuff because it was the locked off area where nobody comes in or out of this this greenhouse but that's why we call it the area 51 plants but as you can see, hot blonde goes from a really dramatic color, changes from that bright, bright yellow to that bright orange uh, red. And believe it or not, these are both just cell phone pictures, non-enhanced too, so intense colors. The, the fall color, uh, I was like, no one's going to believe me. I've got several with just my pale hand in the photo. So people were like, yep, that, that looks like that. Looks like it's not changed colors any. Yeah, and we've got a few of them over here too. We brought a save just for the... It was one of our first ten at ten uh, we did, and it's actually been our most popular tree of the year. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we have been out of it on our website for a little bit, but really cool cool habit to it. So it's really about color contrast when you're talking about color explosion, because if you had all yellows out there, you wouldn't notice it. If you had all reds out there, all greens, you wouldn't notice it. But it's about pairing those different colors, and that can be spring colors, that can be fall colors, and when you pair them, and then it hits. It's that color explosion that's really going to look really good in the landscape. So you got to think about the colors for these. You know, when we, when we lay out a garden, especially we, we garden very maple centric, as you can guess if you've seen my mother's garden, that first picture, if you've been there in person. <laughs> what we try to do is we plan the spring colors to be contrasting, but we also plan the fall colors to be contrasting with the things that are going to be directly beside something. So we don't want two golden yellows or two bright reds or two bright oranges, you know, right in the same neighborhood. We want that wow factor color where each thing is catching the eye and just, just really throwing you in each season, too. So here we've got Asia Palmated Sister Ghost over here. You'll notice the white on green reticulation makes that 8 to 10 foot uh, tree. Over here we have Amber Ghost that's going to have a lot more amber hues to it. <coughs> amber Ghost will almost put on like an orange bright amber this time of the year, too, so the new growth is even more 
color, like orangish color with that. And so these are very popular trees that uh, Town Buckles introduced the Ghost series, uh, which is, uh, it changed the nomenclature. It was so popular for this. You know, normally people refer to this as the reticulatum style, and a lot of people still do. In fact, we still do. But uh, for the most part, when people ask for the style tree, they don't say, I'm looking for a reticulated tree or something from the reticulatum kind of section. They say, I'm looking for one of those maples that's like ghost series or like ghost maple. And we know exactly what they're looking for. It's this, this you know, this etching where each leaf has this divided uh, kind of etching throughout each leaf. And Talon's been a really good friend to us. He sends us IPPS proceedings, rare uh, transcripts on maples from Japan, handwritten books uh, that are in J uh, Japanese with uh, drawings of each of the photo of Japanese maples and fall colors, and he also lets us use some of those photos, like you see here. Um, but the next two are some of our photos, and same trees: sister ghost, yellow, bright, bright orange, and the amber ghost here. So you can yeah. see that contrasting pop, not only in the spring color but also in the fall color. So these are great pairings you can put near each other because through each part of the season they're going to look very dramatically different. One other fun little quick tidbit about Talon, we were presenting at SNA a couple years ago and <laughs> we, we, uh, we always bug Talon about what's new and neat because he introduces a lot of cool trees. We feel really cool now that he's introducing, he's selling a lot of our introductions, which is some fun validation for, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to see that out there. But uh, one of the fun things when we were uh, presenting at, at SNA and Don Shadow said, hey Matt and Tim, we come and do this presentation on maples and it's, you know, it's a quick presentation maybe 200 people in the room and say so you do your presentation and Don said Talon couldn't make it guys that was great uh, I think Bree was in between us he said uh, why don't y'all do the Talon's as well if you don't mind so we got to do a uh, Talon's presentation pop quiz style so uh, luckily uh, most people didn't no, no one knew but uh, we got to do his entire presentation like this and it's a good thing we know a lot of his introductions because it was like this oh well this is uh, Amber Ghost and this would be Sister Ghost up here. And, you know, of course we knew about this tree, so it worked out well, but it was all uh, impromptu pop quiz style. So that was our introduction. That was in our, our introduction to some of these as well. So, so you can also take this uh, to the containers. Uh, obviously, when you're going to containers, you want to think about what's going to contrast, what's going to stay uh, small in those containers. Obviously, with containers too, you want to make sure they've got good uh, drainage. Number one mistake with containers with Japanese maples is poor drainage. Hole gets clogged up, starts filling up with water, you don't notice it, you got a little pond action going in there, and those roots start rotting. And so the best thing to do is keep good drainage, raise it up a little bit off the ground with some pot feed or some uh, paint stirs or something broken up underneath there so people don't see it. Um, so two super popular trees here. I mean, two are most talked about. You know, certainly lace leaves work great for container gardening as well. But a lot of people say, like, what's a great miniature red or a great miniature green? Uh, this is Makawi Tsubusa here on the left, which uh, is probably, we, it's, it's not common, but it's, if we ask maple experts, the question we always ask, which me and Tim always bug everybody, we say, what's your favorite Japanese maple? Every time we talk to somebody who's a maple connoisseur, it's our most common answer is Makawi Tsubusa. So it's certainly very, very popular for this type shingle layering. It was actually the 2015 Maple of the Year at the North American Maple Society, which is the very first Maple of the Year. Uh, and one unanimously the first year pretty quick. Yeah. And, and of course here on the, the other side we have Rhode Island Red, uh, beautiful compact deep uh, burgundy. Uh, Rhode Island Red is named after the Rhode Island Red Chicken, which is a small, small red chicken as well. So Yeah, it was found at Rhode Island Nursery uh, in Rhode Island. But it's a dwarf blood good that is short and multi-stemmed, more lateral, uh, lateral branching. Not, ne not necessarily weeping, but as you can see there, the branches just get denser and denser, which is very, very full and compact. Yeah. Typical for us for, for, you know, even in a 15 year period, it's no more than five to six feet. It does tend to be almost equally as wide. It's a very dense habit to it. Macaulay Etzabusa is another tree while we give a time frame. Uh, if you've toured our display garden, you'll see one of the biggest Macaulay Etzabusas. Uh, it's it's close to 12 feet tall. It's also around 40 years old, though. So, <laughs> but typical for that one in that kind of time frame is more like Macaulay Boost is more like four to five feet as well in 15 years. So we'll talk about Dragon uh, Master, which you all have seen. Uh, some of y'all may have seen at the nursery, um, but this one is actually a one of Talon's. While Dragon Master is one of our weeping yellows, this is Talon's uh, new introduction of Golden Falls. Um, the difference between the two is this one is more like a summer gold. Weeping to type and the Dragon Master, I would compare to like an orange dream. So this one's going to be a uh, more yellow throughout the season, and then goes to a red in the fall. Dragon Master actually leaves out with a lot more pink blushing all over it too. 
And so they're very interesting. They're, they're both, uh, the, both of their lineages obviously come from Ryusin, which is the one here on the right, which you're probably familiar with. Ryusin is a, a unique plant, very, very pendulous. Gets about as tall as you stake it. Um, so I've seen, uh, there's one at Sarah P. Duke that staked up to, last time I looked, it was probably around 12 feet tall. Uh, it would never get that big without, without staking it and getting some height to it right away. But. And Golden Falls is a way to really give that color contrast with that bright yellow and add that in the landscape. I always say that yellow is the most underutilized color in the garden. You always see your greens, people get excited with the reds, but when you put that yellow in there, that's what makes everything pop together. And it brings out your greens and makes them show off and your reds at the same time. Super popular tree for us though. This has been uh, one that just really contrasts well. Again, here's an example of that red popping off that green. These are Ace of Palmetum Orangeola. I love this planting. It's just kind of like rolling mountains. And so it's, uh, it's one of our customers' homes, but it's just fascinating to me. I love how it was used as a continuous, one continuous tree there. Uh, but one yellow is a neat plant that almost contrasts with itself, but you certainly can see the advantages of having that yellow in there to catch the eye. And orange yellow is actually the 2017 maple of the year. Um, it's also run the Royal Horticultural Award of Merit, too, so it's a really... 1993. Yeah, very popular plant wherever it's at, always. And uh, you've got a lovely one out here in full sun over here at the J.C. Rouseman on the walkway that just shows off uh, during the spring when you go through here and you come back during the summer and it's that sharp, that, that green with that orange red new growth coming across it. I mean, it, it really is a, a showcase tree. It's a maple that I like to think about. You know, we think about spring colors and fall colors, but orange yellow is probably my favorite lace leaf because of midsummer. Like normally when you go look at it midsummer, it's green or older growth like you can see here, then like reddish new growth, almost like orange pink tips. And so its contrast with itself is quite intense. And so, again, non-edited photo here. <laughs> People look at this one, they think like, man, he jacked the color up on this one, but no. And the tree on the left, that is our Dragon Master. That is our weeping uh, selection like we're using. It leaves out orange and then goes to the yellow and uh, goes to orangey red in the fall. You probably heard Tim mention, we kind of use our open house, which is every Memorial Day, as our, that's our fashion show runway for the new thing. So anything we're working on developing or that's new and interesting, we always try to debut it first at open house. That's kind of our reward to people that come to visit on Memorial Day. Uh, this year was crazy. We had uh, a lot of people that braved the rain, but we, uh, you know, we were praying and praying and praying because it said 90% rain, and we're like, oh gosh, let this rain miss us. You know, how are we gonna do? We had our busiest day ever in a torrential downpour, 90% rain all day. So I, I guess we were praying for the wrong things because we did great in sales, but it was uh, incredible rain. But everybody that came there was really struck by this tree. It's, it's probably one of our more neat introductions. It's very similar shape to the Ryusin as well. Uh, this one keeps putting on more orangey, kind of pinkish new growth as well, so it kind of blushes for the better, lack of a better term, kind of a pinkish and then orange in midsummer over top of the yellow. There is a yellow Ryusin type in Europe called Cascade Falls, and that is patented over in Europe, what they call PBR. Um, but both of our, our introduction and Talon's introduction of the yellow weeping types, neither one of them are, are patented. Um, up here we have H. palmatum Amaga Shiguri. That is one of those plants you want to give a little protection from the hot afternoon sun. I'd probably do that same with some of these yellow Ryusin types, um, simply because they're yellow, they're new. We don't know exactly their sun tolerance in every location. Um, this one pops in every season, though. It, it's got that reticulated etching again. Um, a, a really fun one from Japan. This one typically is one of the smaller ones for that style of irrigation, too. So Magi Shiguri is only, only normally in about six, maybe even seven feet in 15 years, so it's not a gigantic plant either. It stays a little bit smaller than most, uh, but, but awesome color pattern too. It's almost a little bit more vibrant metallic -y purple too than many. So here we've got Asia Pomatum Geisha Gone Wild. Geisha Gone Wild is actually a reoccurring sport that happens on a cultivar called Geisha. It's just solid pink. If you've um, seen Shiraz, Shiraz is a very, very popular tree. Uh, almost the exact same thing. They actually have different origins. And that's one of the reasons why we don't like patented maples too, is because you'll have two people come up with a very similar plant and, uh, you know, half a world apart. Half a world apart. Uh, Geisha Gone Wild comes from Oregon, where Shiraz originated in New Zealand. Both are the same sport, essentially, off of Geisha. But they're, uh, they're different plants, so they're different origins. They didn't come from the exact same place. Nobody ripped anybody off. But essentially, they're identical plants. And beside it is Summer Gold. Summer Gold was actually found as a chance seedling um, 
at Isley Nursery that they believe to be a cross between uh, Acer cereus solanum aureum and orange dream. And they also, as a sister seedling from that same batch of seedlings, found cereus solanum jordan. And so cereus solanum jordan is listed as a cereus solanum because it looks a little more full moon like. The, uh, That's see, from Girardelli Nursery. From Girardelli Nursery. What did I say? Isley. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but summer gold is a spectacular, spectacular introduction. Probably one of the more heat tolerant yellows once it gets established and uh, goes to a red in the fall. This and hot blonde are two of the only yellows you can put in a good amount of sun. To Michael Steinhardt as well, we'll talk about that one. But very few, most of your yellows, I mean, Arium, forget about it. Don't put that in full sun ever. Uh, most of your yellows, as a rule of thumb, are going to need a little bit of late day shade for protection. So that three o'clock on sun, you got to protect them from. This one's one of the exceptions, though. I mean. Uh, Hot Blonde and Summer Gold can handle that 3 o'clock on sun. And, and, and Michael Steinhardt. Yeah. And Michael Steinhardt, too. You want to talk about Go ahead. Jordan's another one, maybe even more intense. Uh, when me and my wife were dating, she was like, didn't know anything about maples, and she would come by my parents' yard, and she'd say, how's my neon tree doing? Because it's just neon yellow. So for whatever reason, everybody that you know didn't even into horticulture ever, always reacted to this plant in our garden because it's intense. Uh, now since we've been married, I actually moved that tree into our yard because <laughs> she liked it so much. But Jordan's one of those plants that as a young age, the leaf will be a little bit narrower, but as it ages, it gets more full like Acer Shira Solanum Arium, you'll notice. Um, it can take a little more sun and it's a little less finicky than Acer Shira Solanum Arium in the south as well. It still so, does a little better with late day shade on that one. Yeah, overall. give it some late day shade. Uh, and Purple Ghost. These are some of our favorite trees to plant beside each other because you get yellow and purple and then in the fall, you get like a red and a fuchsia red, with the fuchsia red being the purple ghost. So it's, the color contrast just keeps on coming uh, between those two and keeps showing out throughout the season. And while this one here goes more and more yellow during the season, this one may go to more of a maroon during the midsummer, uh, but still providing great color contrast beside each other year round. Love this plant. This is our. Uh plant that just looks good in every season too. Like we always go out and it's not that we forget about this plant, but we, we think it's awesome in the spring. It's like this kind of color, but we always go out in the greenhouses in like late summer and we're just like, holy cow, why are we not doing a million of these? Because the late summer color is really intense too. And so it always shows out and stands out even in really hot climates. Uh, this is Acer Palmetto Mila, uh, introduction by our friend Dick Vandermatt in Holland. Yeah, and this for me, it's one of those plants that is spectacular in the spring. Bright, bright orange new growth, like this orange red new growth you see here. With sort of that sort of malting look with the chartreuse center. It does fade, it fades to a green. But the new growth during the summer is a bright, bright orange red again. And so during the summer, it's one of those plants that everyone who comes in the garden and comes into the nursery, they're like, I want that tree because it looks amazing. It looks like a bouquet of flowers. Lovely color, named after uh, one of our friend's daughters. and. Uh, Really cool overall plant. So, many of y'all probably have grown Ukigumo in your, in your garden and landscape, also known as floating clouds. It's one of those trees in the south that maybe once out of every three years really shows off. We should start that out with, many of you have probably been disappointed with Ukigumo <laughs> in your garden. And, and the reason you're disappointed is because you're looking for the white. It's a beautiful tree. It has a great fall color, but you were looking for the white. And so you got it thinking, hey, this is going to be white in the south. It doesn't. My friend Augustine, he's the chairman of the uh, International Maple Society, and uh, he lives in Toulouse in the south of France there. And uh, we were discussing Ukigumo, and I said I like the tree, but I always let people know up front, like it's, n it's not bright white every season for us. It's very rarely white. has a great orange fall color, but don't expect it to be this color every season. A Hanatura Sato will be for us. And so Augustine said, oh, mine's, mine's always white. Mine's Never faded. Every season I've ever had it, it's been bright white on Nukigumo. Well, I went and visited him in the south of France, and wouldn't you know it, that was the one year, I guess. It just it was as green as could be, so it didn't have any of the white to it. But we love Hanachura Sato. It's a trident maple. It's got smaller leaves. Very popular for bonsai, the trident maples, because of their durability. But the color on that one is very consistently bright white. Uh, and for any of the bright whites, what you want in the spring is a slow spring, too. So, uh, you know, not leafing them out in high heat climates will work, and you know, where it just kind of slowly changes, you'll get more intense colors. So, one thing about Hanatura Sato is it's white in the spring. During the summer, it goes green. And so, you really get the most consistent colors when the tree gets right around three to four feet and is outside, not in uh, a cold frame or not 
uh, in uh, protected up near your house, it's best for the plant to be outside in the ground where it experiences those cold temperatures that break up the color pigments in the leaves. Typically for us, we get this kind of color. Gosh, we've got one in the ground now that's probably close to 10 to 12 feet tall, mm -hmm. a very mature one. And we get this kind of color on it for about a month in early spring. Now, like Tim was saying, late summer, it certainly will green up. But uh, it's always very consistent on the color. If you're looking for a white maple, this is a white trident maple, Asa Bergerianum, that can handle a lot more sun than a lot of the other trees. And it, the reason it handles so much sun is because it's white in the spring when it's soft. And then as the summer goes in, it turns more green. Now, if you can give this one late day shade, it certainly can take the sun. But if you have an opportunity to give this one late day shade, like that 3 o'clock on protection, you will carry that bright white color later into the season as well. And so here we've got a good pairing of the Honda Churisato with Acer Palmatum Noel. Noel was actually a sport that was found on Shin de Sojo. Some of you may be familiar with that, at least as a cherry red in the spring. Well, this one is a variegated sport that was found uh, at John O'Brien's nursery in Connecticut. At O'Brien a Nursery, is mainly a hosta nursery. Um, Imagine if you took kind of everything you liked about Arena Nonishki or Asahi Zuru and then combined it with uh, Shinda Sojo. So two really colorful plants. It has those pink kind of swirling misshapen leaves wherever the variegation hits. It kind of swirls. Um, so it's kind of the Orita no Nishiki version of Shinda Sojo. And the knock on Shinda Sojo is it's electric in the spring and it goes green during the summer and then it's electric during the fall with just that bright fire engine red again. Well, during the summer when it's supposedly green, this one has variegation with the green. So you get some added interest even during that during the summer. Another tree that really pops and has a ton of color and just contrasts with itself and uh, extremely well, but when you pair this with something like that bright white, uh, I mean, the two were just electric together. And this tree was named by the late Dennis Dodge, um, and uh, it was also a good friend of ours. Um, Dennis was uh, one of these guys, he, he never left his house, but he knew where every plant was in the world. And so he, he, he would go and sit in his basement with him for hours looking at things on the internet. And every time I wanted to buy something from him, he wouldn't sell it to me, so I just took him 10 weird plants. And then I left with like a treasure chest of 10 weird plants, but I never bought a tree from the man in his life. And we, it was really fun. And uh, We went and sat down with him in his uh, office, and he pulls up on his computer photos of evaluations, some, of, evaluations ours. of ours that we hadn't released or sent out to anybody that I could think of. of this. <laughs> he says, like, what are you doing here? Your how, computer how you, actually, you have pictures of this. Yeah. It's crazy. It would be like in Europe, and you'd email him and be like, what garden is this one plant in? And he would know, you know, never been there, but you go here and you go to the left, and here's that plant you're looking for. So Michael Steinhardt, this is the golden trident maple. It gets it's yellow, gets more and more yellow throughout the season. Um, it's electric, gives it some sunlight that gets more and more yellow with the sunlight. Again, one of our most interesting uh, of the trident maples. Tridents are super popular for bonsai, but this one keeps the yellow the strongest and it has amazing fall colors too. This one normally has more kind of orangey new growth to it throughout the season too. So like late summer, it's not uncommon for it to be a little bit more like orange yellow on top of that. Yeah. Uh, another yellow that can actually handle a little bit of sun too. The original one, this was well, an introduction by Don Shadow, the original one is right around uh, 15 feet and it's about 15 feet after about 15 years. Um, so it, it's definitely got some uh, a mid-sized growers, not as large as some of the other trident maples. I'm sure the yellow keeps back some of that but it is a strong uh, grower for us for sure. So we're going to do a few of the really neat, cool things. These are some of our 10 at 10 items you may have been seeing pop off. A lot of these are spring colors, too. Uh, celebration. Talon says this may be the best tree he's ever introduced, and I'd be hard-pressed to tell him he was wrong about that. Uh, lovely color patterns. Another of that reticulated type. Uh, Talon decided to quit calling anything Ghost Series. So uh, I joke with some of my customers that collect the entire Ghost Series. If you want this one, you can call it Celebration Ghost because it's in that same lineage, but it's just Celebration. Yeah, this one was found, I believe, as a seedling from Amber Ghost. And mm -hmm. it just has some electric color. It's really more of that pink color. And it's that pink color in the spring. It fades down to like a, a almost lime green on, on white reticulated variegation. Mm -hmm. And then the new growth during the summer is pink to purple again. So it contrasts itself really well uh, throughout each season. And again, with some late day shade, you'll pull these colors stronger. Later in the season, you'll keep the bright pinks with late day shade. 
much more intensely late in the season. But just really fun color pattern. So this is another uh, Trident Maple. We are big fans of the Trident Maples. There's probably, I think there's only about 30 cultivars of Trident Maples like listed in a cultivation. Um, and I think we've got probably 15 or 20 of them. At least, there's not more. <laughs> yeah. And this is a reticulated type. In the spring, it's almost like that Hanachura Sato, but it's a yellow Hanachura Sato. So this is uh, one called Golden Pharaoh. So it keeps that, it has that kind of etching throughout each leaf. It doesn't hold that color late into the season either. It will green up, especially in heavy sun, it will get more green. But it almost keeps the spring color more intense as a result of that. The spring color is always very, very striking yellow like this. And it's, really, it's just really neat because it has that, uh, one of the few tridents that has an etching throughout every single leaf. So it kind of looks like a ghost series type thing. And so this is uh, Acer rubicens. It's a snake bark maple called Red Flamingo. Mm. And it was found as a sport off of civil car uh, silver cardinal. And so people all the time argue over uh, which uh, hybrid species of snake bark this is. Because snake barks are the most promiscuous plants in the garden. And so like, I'd be hard pressed to ever tell you this is specifically from this seedling because my goodness, if you've got five snake barks in, in your garden, they've, they've probably all cross pollinated a million times. But this one is a beautiful pink reticulation. This is going a little bit towards fall color where that pink's in, uh, uh, starting to highlight up again during the fall. Uh, but pink then fades to the white. And then during the, the fall again, it intensifies up to a pink on red. You may be familiar with snake barks, but the reason they have that term is because they actually have like reticulated bark to them too. So the bark kind of has that almost Striations. that smooth, almost looks like snake skin. It's like almost like a smooth skin with like reticulations throughout each, uh, you know, each part of it. And so this one has pink bark too, which is pretty neat. So it's one of our, our favorite snake barks and definitely a pretty show one at that. I love when they have the Samaras on them. The snake barks actually have string like seeds that hang down so the seeds that hang down come down these little clusters and especially with some of the variegated ones that are intensely pink and things like that on the seeds so it kind of kind of almost makes it look you know more intense too when they're when they have some seed to them so we've been talking about reds and yellows and variegated all this fun stuff so i thought we'd talk about a green one <laughs> so we've got acer pomade of emerald isle uh, this is a broad spreading more uh, dwarf type it's a newer introduction by uh, talon as well uh, with uh, chartreuse uh, green new growth over top of green the fall color uh, is a bright red uh, great for pairings for greens that go with yellows or reds that go to yellows um, but definitely a fun uh, newer dwarf uh, Japanese maple with a broad spreading canopy really has a nice this is the new growth flush over there but really nice I mean it does get more like emeraldy color too so another really fun one if you hadn't noticed we like the variegated stuff uh, if you come to a color explosion talk, I guess you like variegated tip plants as well. So this is another uh, a fun variegated one, the uh, Jubilee. The difference of this one is it, it flushes more like pink over top of this. So it kind of, for lack of a better term, we've started calling this like blushing. Because you'll have the green older growth, but then it kind of blushes pink throughout it. So you get those accents throughout each part of the foliage. And here's Jubilee in the fall color. You still get that reticulated variegation, which shows up amazing, but with some red coming in there. And so you get almost completely opposite from the spring to the fall. Very similar to the other ghost series trees. This is in that same lineage of ghost series, so it's not a ghost series plant, but you know, it's similar in its, its heritage for sure. These can handle sun, but if you keep them in late day shade, you'll have more intensity. Like you'll carry that style bright white in, into the uh, etching later into the season. So the batwing maple. If you ever want to have some comedy, go back and look <laughs> at some of our old YouTube videos when we were first starting out with YouTube, and you'll see me in a Spider-Man costume <laughs> and Matt in a Batman outfit talking Chevy about Batman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Acer picked up Usagumo, the Batwing Maple. Um, but in the spring color, is a bright, bright uh, coral color, and then it goes to the white. And the leaves can be about this big, and just that white reticulated variegation throughout the summer. Sometimes the new growth flushes can be a little more green, uh, but as they mature out, they, they go to that bright, bright, bright white, which you see up here in the top right hand corner. Just super, super amazing tree. It's one of my favorites. Really difficult to propagate. If you want to propagate this, you've got to graft it during the summer, because for us, winter grafting just doesn't add up for us for this one. Really a cool plant. Acer pictums are a little bit more heat tolerant. 
Um, it gets a big rounded leaf to it too. These are all different spectrums there in early spring. Again, the bright, bright white, like the one you see up here at the top, that's actually more like late summer kind of color to it. But uh, fun thing, yeah, we, we dressed up like Spider-Man and Batman, and then we went to Black Mountain, and we were in the Black Mountain News the next day, and it said, Batman, Matt Nichols, Spider-Man, Tim Nichols. It's like, well, our covers are blown now. <laughs> that was the, on the, uh, the ad for the... Yeah. I picked this up again. Well, it can actually get fairly big with age. It, it takes time. Um, say in, in 15 years, you're looking at a tree that's going to be right around 8 to 10 foot. I have seen one that was... 15, 20 feet. Now it was more like a 30 year old plant to be that kind of age, that size. So. And we've got one right now that's right around 10 years old and it's right around six foot. Um, and you know, it's got a nice canopy to it. It's gorgeous. It's uh, on the lower side of my parents' yard. And uh, it, it's one of my favorite plants for sure. And again, those whites, you add those into the garden because that's that other color that you really don't think about much, but they really add a lot to the gut landscape. Dark Knight, so you're probably familiar with Purple Ghost. Dark Knight has even darker, more intense colors. Batman was Dark Knight, so of course we're big geeks. We had to get Dark Knight too. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't let that one pass. But uh, I guess Tim will get to dress up like Batman this year and talk about that one. So Dark Knight was found as a chance ceiling from Amber Ghost. Um, it's an amazing, amazing selection. The reason I like it is because during the summer, when it's outside, it actually still holds that reticulated veins throughout the summer. Remember when I talked about Purple Ghost? will go to more of a maroon during the summer. And you often lose those reticulated variegation during the summer, but you get them in the spring. This one, you still see the veins of the leaf even throughout the summer. Which, Especially as it's established, you start to see more of that kind of etching even super, super late into the season. And, and more dark, dark color to this one too. And that sort of shows you some of the, the summer colors in the greenhouse. And our greenhouses do heat up quite a bit. If any of you all there for the conference study you know that <laughs> it, it warms up in June um, and July especially. I mean, it can be 115 degrees in our, our cold frames during the day. And you still should see some reticulated variegation in, on those older growth, which is amazing. So this is one of my favorite species. This is Acer calcaratum. Um, some people call it Acer calcaratum. Um, but Acer uh, calcaratum, it's in section palmata. It's, it's closely related to the Japanese maples as your japonicums and shirasalums but it's from China. And so this is actually a super, super rare Chinese maple. Has a really unusual uh, trilobed leaf to it. Pink new growth, looks almost tropical, uh, over green. You the new growth is always exceptionally colorful. I mean, I've seen it be green, orange, pink. I mean, just the new growth is always really vibrant and, and really contrasts with, you know, the older late summer color is typically more green, but the new growth flushes over it really intense. And this is one of those trees that we took Tony's advice and planted something that people said wasn't going to grow for us. <laughs> and it, it grew fantastic. We, um, we've had this uh, in our landscape. It's right around 10, 12 feet. It's went through negative nine. Um, so it's extremely cold hardy selection. And it may be too geeky for you, but a lot of people were always grafting this one onto pseudoplatinus. And so very commonly in the trade, this, this isn't in America at all. In fact, we're the only people that offer this one in the U.S. But in Europe, most people were grafting this one onto Acer Pseudoplatinus. And uh, a lot of things will work on Pseudoplatinus, but they don't love it. And so instead of doing that, we decided it was in section Palmata. And so it, it's essentially another cousin of the Japanese maples, just like that Acer Oliviernum. And so we grafted on the same understock we would put any of our Japanese maples on. And as a result, it's really thrived for us. It's made it a lot more hardy, a lot more durable, and a lot prettier, honestly, of a plant. We actually had the first recorded case of this seeding in uh, Maples for the World, uh, D.M. Van Gelder had listed that this tree had never been saw seed and seed. And I guess because it wasn't on its own roots a lot, so most people were grafting it to an understock that maybe caused it not to. And so we've been putting this on to Palmatum, and as a result, we've had some seeds. We actually donated a big one here for the uh, the Arboretum, too. You have to check out if you like the plant. There's a nice size. that little hyphen there. It shouldn't be there, but... <laughs> but awesome species. We, we like the species. Of, we're, we're really into the species, especially if they contrast or do something different. So. Yeah, this, this tree has some really good fall color too, bright oranges and reds. Typically a little later than a lot of the Japanese maples. Um, but it's really been one of those unique species that's amazing. And I was really surprised that we could actually grow it and it would do so well for us. I mean, for years we kept it in a protected greenhouse. Then we said, let's plant it out. We plant it out. And just year after year, we kept coming back it's and we were looking at like, wow, we went through that winter. Wow, went through that winter. And it's opposite from what the books say because they say, oh, this is going to be soft. 
no one had tried. It looks it tropical, but no one was trying it. So this is another uh, reticulated type. This is actually a newer one, uh, another one by, by Talon, one of the newest introductions, called Nebula. Um, maybe tell Nebula is similar to the Jubilee. It'll have that bright white overgrowth, but this one kind of blushes purple. So especially if you put them side by side, you'll see the differences. The other one blushes really bright, it's like hot pink, and this one blushes more bright purple as they mature, especially. And uh, Nebula is just a really fun one. It's one that the reticulation is almost like you just look deeper into it every time you look at it. So this is another trident maple. This is one that gives you amazing spring yellow, and then it's green during the summer with oranges to reds in the fall. And sometimes, last year it went to like this electric almost pink um, in the fall. Which you is know really the most intense yellows though? Bling bling is like... Lemon lime. It is, it is highlighter yellow for the whole spring. I mean, typically for about a month we get this kind of color pattern here. Now we'll put on yellowish new growth over top of that. I mean, so it, the new growth will be bright yellow, but it does have greener older growth. It's one of the most intense yellows we do there for sure. So jet black. This is an upright Japanese maple. Going to probably be right around that 12 to 14 foot in height. But it holds that darker color, and it's going to be one of the darkest Japanese maples. There's Acer palmatum nigrum, and you put that beside this, and it's even darker. This picture was actually taken about three weeks ago uh, in the greenhouses. So you can see it hold that, holds that color exceptionally well late into the season. And it's just a darker style red than most of your other red types, for sure. And this is in 55% white poly which is something that doesn't hold their color well. And it's also in that 115 degree heat we talked about, which also doesn't hold their color well. Our Tamukiyamas are greenish red at the same time, and our uh, jet black, that dark, dark, dark purple. It's really a fun new, uh, new plant for the garden, and just, uh, it's a different color than everything else, especially throughout the summer. Blonde Beauty, this is one we'll be offering, it'll probably be next spring before we offer this one. Uh, another of Talon's introductions. Uh, we sent him a hot blonde, he sent us a, hot, a blonde beauty. <laughs> Go figure. I guess we were thinking similar things. <laughs> and uh, this is a blonde beauty again. Uh, it's more of a yellow on the reticulation, so you get a lot of that yellowish green color to it. Um, and as you see, it has a spreading habit to it, which will, which will be re a really nice addition to the landscape. But that one's a newer one that, a little new to us, we still have to evaluate a little bit. Snow cloud. It, it, if you're familiar with this one, uh, it's an awesome plant. We've got 150 different types of ginkgos, and so everybody loves variegated ginkgos. There is a lot of instability to some of that variegation, though, in a lot of the variegated ones. I've never had snow cloud revert on it, so I've probably produced around 1,000 of these uh, from graft, and I've never had one that showed up that was all green. And so it really impresses me for a variegated uh, ginkgo, because it, it, it doesn't revert for us at if all. You, if you see a ginkgo in the nursery tray, it's kind of rare, uh, called frosty, it is the same thing. Barry Inger actually brought it from Japan and then named it Frosty uh, years ago, sold it through uh, his, his nursery. and We were building numbers on it. It was our top secret. We got it from Barry and we were like, man, look at this. This is, this is so cool. You know, he hadn't shared it with anybody else. And, so, and then Snow Cloud hit the market. Well, somebody else imported the exact same plant from Japan, but had, had distributed it more widely. So this name was more common. But we do know now that Snow Cloud and Frosty are the same plant. But give this a little protection from the hot afternoon sun, four or five hours of sunlight. Um, this is going to be white. I mean, as the name Snow Cloud says, or Frosty, either one, it's going to give you a lot of white color in the landscape. More upright tree, six to eight foot in ten years. And it makes more of a small tree shape, so it's not something that's just super dense and fat, but it makes like a nice small tree. And give your ginkgos line, garden line, and uh, it, it's one of those <laughs> things that really makes them grow and, and get established quicker. They like more alkaline soil, and we often have a lot more acidic soils and our areas. Beautiful plant though, and it really shows out. Even late summer right now, they're quite striking. It's going to be on one of our new upcoming tenant tens, and gosh, there's probably 50 or 60 of them there in the greenhouse, and the whole section is just glowing. I mean, they kind of still have this kind of color to them right now. Uh, maybe that last picture more than right now. This yeah, is more early spring. Good. Yeah. But yeah, it kind of has like a yellowish hue to it early spring too. So Pepe Starfish, this is one of our favorite newer Japanese maples. Not as quick growing as like an emperor or a blood good. Probably going to be more in that eight foot range uh, in 10 years. And the leaf comes down like a starfish. It was a selection by Piet Bergelt. Many of y'all may have seen Peve Minaret um, or seen this offer. Peve, what it is, is it's a combination of his name, Piet, sometimes known as Pete, Bergelt, Peve. 
Hmm. And he puts his name right there in front of a lot of his introductions. And uh, just neat, neat introduction with that starfish a shape to the leaf. So guy introduced uh, American, that's his wife. It's kind of funny, it's a plant world so small, our friend Talon was over visiting him, and uh, Piet asked him, he said, hey, what do you think I should name that? And he said, starfish. And uh, Talon actually later. put the name on uh, Piet Bergelt's tree of Pepe starfish. I, I first saw this tree in Holland at Esfeld and was like, this is crazy, we've got to be growing this. I mean, Trumpenberg's popular, but it's a more intense dwarf form of that with, you know, I mean, just each foliage just looks like a little starfish. And the leaf cups more, you know, basically the new growth will flush out a little bit flatter, but then the new growth returns that older growth as it ages with that, that cupped foliage. So this is one of my favorite ginkgos. Snow cloud is your white. Beijing gold in the spring, to give it some sunlight, can be a yellow. And it'll be a yellow in the spring, and then the yellow starts fading as the green pushes the yellow out. And uh, this year in the greenhouses, we didn't have it as much as we did last year. But really, our uh, ones we had last year were all three gowns, so they're a little bit larger, which could give you a little more consistent color. Bright, bright yellow, though. Kind of, kind of has a glowy yellow hue to the whole plant in the early spring. This is an early spring picture. And then during the summer, after it does go green, all the new growth during the summer has a streaks of variegation in it. So this one just kind of has these little exaggerated striping, almost like little tiger stripes throughout each leaf. And another ginkgo that we like, because I've never seen it revert. So even uh, every season is still, I mean, it might have some green folds midsummer, it might not be always as intense, but I've never seen it lose its variegation. And so for a ginkgo that gives you some color, this one definitely provides a lot of yellow color in the landscape, and in the fall as well. You know, ginkgos are just a spectacular uh, with their fall color. And Beijing Gold is actually a selection from China, and then we've got Snow Cloud is a selection from Japan, which is kind of neat. Japanese Princess, very popular one. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Makawi Yetsubusa we talked about earlier. Normally everybody's top of their list when we say, what's your favorite Japanese maple? Well, uh, Japanese Princess is kind of like the best offspring of that, if you will. So this is in that same lineage of Makawi Yetsubusa. Still has that tight, dense layering to it. Um, kind of gives a more of a blonder, older growth with then bright pink new growth over top of that midsummer. And with a little bit more sun early, in the early part of the season, the whole tree will be all this color pink. So with shade, you get more of that contrasting color, too. And so I'd probably give this tree uh, some morning sun and afternoon shade for best peak colors. Um, the more and more we move them around the garden, the more and more I'm starting to see that if you put it in full sun, you get amazing spring colors. During the summer, you don't get as much color. But if you give it some morning sun and afternoon shade, you get more colors throughout the season. So this is actually one of Talon's newest introductions. We actually got to introduce this one. Um, he, he sent us a bunch of wood on it, and it's uh, Acer Pomatum Waveleaf. This was one of his rising stars. Basically, he has all of his seedlings he goes through. The ones that don't make the cut become rising stars. And he said, why didn't I choose that one? And then he looked in the thing and sort of sat at the side, and every single person who Gardner was coming through trying to tag his larger trees said, I want that tree. I want that tree. It's so like he took it out of the sales area. So he took it back out of the back. sales area and uh, sent us wood on it, and it's called wave leaf. It has more of a shinier uh, leaf to the leaf than a purple ghost. It's a little bit more glossy. I mean, it's hard to explain sometimes in a picture, but this one kind of has a shimmer to every leaf, so it kind of looks, almost looks like it's wet. And the leaves here around the sides are kind of wavy, and they curl a little bit, which really give this tree a really soft, glossy sheen that makes it stand out. Of course, you probably know Sherman's Nordlich. We've talked about this plant a lot, but it's one of our favorites. I'd probably put this in one of my top five plants we do. Really love this plant. Uh, Sherman's Nordlich, the name means Northern Lights, uh, the Nordlich part. Uh, so you see it sometimes sold as Northern Light. Uh, Sherman's Nordlich, though, is an awesome dwarf Don Redwood. There's one of the biggest ones in the country out here in front of the lab house. It's uh, I actually, to talk about town a lot, but town actually donated that one to the J.C. Ralston. Um, a while back, so. Yeah. And it's funny because Hank Van Kempen actually introduced the tree. When we were going to take cuttings to graft and produce all of our trees, uh, Hank was actually visiting, and he actually walked up the same time we were cutting on the tree, and he we're said, calling Tim saying, hold off on pruning, hold off on pruning, we want some side wood. And, and Hank had sent wood to Talon, and Talon had donated it here, the, one of the first ones, and then we were taking cuttings off of it and met Hank, and he told us the story of how Sherman was his customer and had this witch's broom happen in his Metasequoia white spot. 
we were actually at a plant conference and there was a question of what's a witch's broom and also variegated. So this is one of the few trees I could come up with that was a variegated plant that also had a witch's broom on it. We've introduced a few since then. Of a tree, yeah. Yeah, but there's very few things that are witch's broom and variegated. So this is an Eastern Prime made of pastel. This one has a pink pastel color to it, and it's very, very pastel throughout the season as well. Just keeps putting on kind of like soft pinks, whites to yellows as it, as it matures. And it's again one of those ghost type series type plants, again in that lineage of. I that photo's not coming through as well there, but it has that reticulated variegation with some red fall color on it. <coughs> so this is a, one of my favorite climbing hydrangeas. Um, climbing hydrangeas, you always want to give them something to climb on, be it you know your wooden lattices or uh, wooden fence or an old tree, uh, but this is Kuga variegated. And this one for us uh, has been able to handle a lot more sun than some of the other uh, hydrangea anomalies that uh, we've been growing. And just keeps having that yellow to white with uh, variegations on those green. Really need to give you some colors besides the blooms whenever they, they bloom. It's a great way to add color to an area where you have an older oak tree or something. Especially, like, they can handle the sun, but in the shade it's really going to pop with variegation. And so you've got an area in your garden that's dark and you know, you've got nothing really going on there. It's a great plant to add to an some existing tree. We've been, we've been putting them on some older poplars and some older oak trees around our display garden there at my uncle's and really enjoy the results. You typically want to give them more protection from the high afternoon sun, um, but uh, this is one that for us has been able to handle more sun. For Especially us. as they mature. Yeah, this one a younger plant has been able to handle a lot more sun than a lot of the other uh, common hydrangeas. So this is one of my favorite Japanese maples. Um, it's one of the fastest growing. It's called Germain's Gyration. A twisting, contorting Japanese maple. And you see how the branchings just twist and contort. So this is actually a customer of ours down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So if I had a dollar for every time somebody says, how big does that get? I'll be dead by the time that's there. <laughs> I'm like, well, Japanese maples will outlive us all. <laughs> so, but this is one that we call it the Mack truck of Japanese maples because it gets big really quickly. Uh, and so it's not uncommon in a 10 year period for this one to be 12 by 12 already. This one is an introduction by Isley Nursery. <laughs> and yeah, it's named after Jermaine Isley. Isley. So, and, yeah. and so this one gives the appearance of a 100 year old tree in a relatively short time frame. So you'll get those big, you know, long wood looking garden size dissectums in, in a relatively short time frame. And typically more on the orange side of the fall color. Um, it's Gosh. hard to see the size of this tree. This is an old picture. Now this tree's triple that. that, that this photo was last year. Last That's fall. bigger than that now, by yeah, far. It, it's grown uh, probably a foot and a half to two foot in each direction since last year. And Really brilliant oranges, though. This really doesn't do it justice. It's a green, but then brilliant oranges to yellows in the fall. Uh, and this Actually, this exact tree is in a customer of ours garden. And they, the, the, not, that was in our garden, but this one's in a customer of ours garden. And uh, it's a very old plant. It looks probably smaller than it is with a house right there beside it, but it's it's probably a good 15 to 20 feet wide by probably 10 to 12 feet tall already. And um, a nursery in Oregon offered him a, a ton of money to dig this up and put it on a refrigerated truck and drive it to their display garden. And he, he said he'd rather than drive it through the house. So he, he said, no, we're not we're not moving it. But uh, I, it was it was a nice nice penny for for one plant. This one here we planted as a seven gallon. Four years later. It's every bit of eight to nine feet tall and probably 12 to 15 foot wide. Um, so it does grow quickly. It's one that you have to have space for a tree that gets that big that quick. But if but, you have some room for one to, uh, to take off, it, it's, it's quite fun to watch. And I, I, I tell this joke frequently when I talk about this plant, but I had a 92 year old lady come to the nursery and she said, uh, I want the tree that goes the quickest. And I showed her this tree, then showed her around the nursery. Quite a lively lady too. Yeah, she was pretty lively. and. <laughs> She said, all right, I'm going to take that Germain's gyration. And I reached down to pick up the tree. She pinched me on the butt. <laughs> and then I turned around and looked at her, and she said, I still got it. <laughs> hey, what do you do with it? But anyways, it was hilarious. Um, and so every time I think about Germain's gyration, I think about that 92-year-old lady who pinched me on the butt. She was, <laughs> oh, yeah, she is, actually. She was at a talk about her. She's still here, and Tim almost started into that story. I'm like, hey, hey, Tim. <laughs> Still lively at 94. <laughs> yeah. You got this color. <laughs> so this is actually a tree I, I, I love. I'm growing to love it more. Um, we offer this tree now, um, but we can only ship it within North Carolina. 
So this is a rare tree that you don't get to see very often because you have to find someone in North Carolina who can sell it because this is actually an endangered tree. It's on the endangered species list. So as a result, it's illegal to transport across state lines. These were completely obtained legally though and grafted onto Kynanthus virginicus oh. understocks. Retusus. Retusus. Yeah. So this is just as hardy as the Chinese root system that it's on. And so all these are grafted to uh, Kynanthus uh, retusus, which uh, is more uh, resistant to the emerald ash borer. I don't know if the, the, the pygmaeus will be uh, resistant as well. That's something we uh, was asked about earlier. Um, but I think, I'm hoping that that will help uh, give it some advantages. But pygmaeus is a smaller growing, uh, almost very similar to the Kynanthus virginicus that people are familiar with. It's uh, a dwarf form of the Grancy Graveyard. You often see this tree People will say, hey, look at this kind of this pygmaeus. You can just search on Facebook and you'll find lots of people saying, look at this kind of this pygmaeus. It's really just a kind of this virginicus. Yeah, they just have a young kind of this virginicus. Yeah, it's a young or smaller kind of this virginicus. But the way you can tell is it has much, much uh, smaller blooms, still clusters and makes the same gorgeous display, but the actual blooms themselves are much, much smaller. So that's one easy way to identify uh, kind of this pygmaeus. But this tree puts on an amazing display and it's one of those trees that's a really beautiful tree. It's going to get about six, eight foot. It's actually a stronger grower than the uh, Kynanthus virginicus. I was talking uh, to people at the Bach Tower Institute, and it was Bach Tower Gardens. They they say it never ever falls over unless someone just runs over the lawn over. And it's one of those plants that just always has a strong root system to it, and develops a nice uh, little tree about six, eight foot, um, very, very, very beautiful foliage. Also, no endangered species were harmed in the recreating of these. <laughs> yes, these were grafted off of trees in the arboretum setting. Um, so these weren't taking cuttings off of trees in the wild. You don't have to worry about that. All these were produced very legally. We just apparently, uh, we can't ship them out of the state and, until we uh, figure out a way to get a permit. <laughs> really cool plant though. Yeah. One we've really been excited about getting to offer for a while. But it's great for the bees. Um, it's a great endangered tree that's just going to give you a lot of white color in the spring with those, those blooms. And uh, a nicer, denser habit too. Oh yeah. Uh, sunshade? I would probably give it partial. Okay. So this is another one of our inductions. Uh, we say it's one of our inductions. Many of y'all may know Laddie Munger who actually uh, found this tree, is he? I don't know if he's in the <laughs> yeah. tonight. He did our grafting class when we did the grafting yeah. class probably the first time, 2012. Yeah. And uh, he'd been sending us pictures of those trees for years. He has this 20 year old seedling in his backyard. This is actually a picture of one of the branches of the old bark on the tree. And so we just fell in love with this tree as a kind of an improved form of bihu because it's, it's more durable for us. The, uh, the spring color has this bright blushing of pink over the whole tree, too. And so it kind of has more pinkish new growth in the early spring. Now, it will fade to a green. The colors are going to be very similar to most of your coral bark types. But for the early spring, the whole tree for a while is bright pink. And Laddie's tree, it's, when we first went and started taking cuttings off, it was every bit of eight to nine foot. You know, it got a large base on it. And it was yellow all the way down to the base. And that just really, really gave us uh, a lot of hopes with this tree. And this tree's really been a good grower and keeps showing all the same traits that we've been looking at. So we've been really loving this tree. But it also goes to an orange in the fall. Another yeah, another tree gives you some great yellow bark if you're looking for an alternate to be who. Acer Roof Nerve Winter Gold. I uh, was actually named uh, by some of our friends at Yamina Rare Plant Nursery in Australia. Um, but just has that bright electric red bark on a snake bark maple. Again, snake bark because it has those striations, it'll come almost like a snake. But this one's gonna have that bright, bright, bright yellow. This does have green foliage in the spring. The, uh, the picture you see over here is the fall color, as it's going into fall color with the golden foliage. Really intense. I love going and just standing in one of these and taking a picture in the fall because it, it just looks electric. I mean, the bark is neon yellow and the foliage is neon yellow, and so it's really intense. But it's a fun plant for every season. I mean, out of leaf, it really shows out. So we did get to go to Japan. We were on a Japanese TV show. Um, no, it wasn't a Japanese game show, but they did, they did make us run towards the camera doing weird high steps and yell, Nippon ni ikitai! If you ever watch Japanese TV, it's very campy. I was, I was convinced that I was going to have like a high pitched voice since I'm kind of a big guy anyway. Like I was like, oh, I'm gonna, this is going to be really goofy when I see myself on this, but it was really fun. Um, so when we were talking about color explosion, we had to show 
photos from Japan when we really saw an amazing color explosion of Japanese maples just really electrifying the landscape. So we talked about some, some different cultivars. These will be more landscape type shots where you can kind of get ideas of the thematic kind of creations you can do uh, with just Japanese maples. As yeah, well. And this is Nakata-san here. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing guy who really showed us a lot and took us around and introduced us to some neat places. And we, uh, we started out the TV show. One of the things we did is, uh, and it didn't even make it onto the show. We probably talked to you a little bit about the show, but not about this part of it. Nakata-san took us into the woods where we kind of looked at how maples were growing natively, and then we went back and recreated that garden with some of his plants in his, uh, in his nursery. And so we kind of looked at how the native habitat was working with the river there and how it was going, and then we went and tried to recreate that same look. So this is Naka Komodo weeping. Uh, if we ever do a book, one of these pictures will probably be the cover of the book. This is the 600-year-old Japanese maple we were talking about. It's in the uh, the Fukushima prefecture where all the craziness happened with it, the tsunami. It's often referred to as national treasure. Uh, so when we were in Japan, they were a little taken back because we'd already made one trip to Japan. This wasn't our fifth trip to Japan. I mean, the sh show was called Nippon Niki Tai. Everyone wants to go to Japan, but we'd already been once before. We were always up front that we'd been to Japan once before, but we didn't advertise it a ton on that. We, if they asked, we said yes, but we weren't like, hey, by the way, we know what we're doing a little bit. So I had my phone connected with pocket Wi-Fi, and I was following where we were at, where we were going, what was near us, and we had a day of rain shooting. And I told Matt, I said, I think we're up north near their national treasure. I think we're near the oldest re uh, tree recorded in, in Japan. And so we were looking at Nakata-san's brochure, and of course we're translating it with, pocket, or with the Google Translate and everything and reading all the lines on the brochure, and it said, we're within this far of Nakakomoto weeping, and I thought, <laughs> national could treasure. that be the national treasure tree? And so we started bugging uh, Nakata-san a little bit, and he was kind enough to drive us on our day off while they were shooting B-roll. An hour and a half. Yeah, an hour and a half north uh, from where we were his nursery. An hour and a half back <coughs> to see this tree. And it's actually at a temple. We probably didn't, I, I didn't put a photo here of the temple of it beside the temple. The stakes uh, on this, uh, and we'll be putting together, I need to do a really good YouTube video of this at some point because we have probably more footage than you could ever imagine of us walking around talking about this tree. But Ace K was our translator who was hanging out with us on our days off. And so we had to basically read every single thing uh, the stakes around this tree actually were dated around 200 years old themselves, so kind of the, the stakes holding that up, but a uh, really cool tree to see, and it was just in great fall color. Yeah, we hit it just the right time. And there's another, another shot from the front on. Part and there's there. actually a sister seedling, or maybe a rooted cutting from this one. Maybe a seedling. It's actually a little bit different fall color. I think it came from that one, according to some of the things. They, they try to keep propagating because they're afraid at some point this one here may pass away. They know at some point it's going to have, it's going to age out, and so they've got another one right here beside of it to continue on its legacy. And then all around the, the area, there's little seedlings or cuttings in people's yards or right around the, the temple. As so you can see, those are future uh, ones that may be in that place. This tree is around 600 years old, and its legacy would be Ryusin and then the selections from Ryusin. So if you, you start out here and then eventually you get the things like Dragon Master that are yellow versions essentially of this tree. And this one tree has that palmate leaf with that twisting weeping habit. It's just a, in awe though. You, you know, you stand there something that's 600 years old and you think this is crazy. You know, you start to like do the math and you're like, America's how old? And you're like, how old's this? And how old's this? But then you're like, this is nuts. You know, you just start, your mind just starts to go through all the things. And a really cool experience. Uh, so, so okay. no, you go ahead. We had to, we had to, we had to show you one little clip of this too while we're going through our Japan photos. Uh, our friend, uh, she kind of blew up, got super popular. You probably saw it on um, this lady right here. What's the YouTube page? Uh, real big story. Yeah, great big story or real big story or yeah, yeah. maybe great big story. Yeah, but uh, she was preparing the uh, maple tempura. And so, super popular. Right there, We're thinking about trying this if we do a fall open house one year, uh, preparing some maple tempura. We actually shot a huge segment where they wanted Tim to look really dumb, and so <laughs> like me and him. So they wanted us to do it wrong so they could show us doing it right on the TV show. And so that part didn't make it into the TV show either. But like, it did. did it? It did. Like me and Tim were like going out in our garden, like now, 
and we were pulling leaves off like big japonicums that are this big and like taking them in. And they asked me of all people <laughs> to cook them. Yeah, he was trying to make maple tempura. I don't cook. He blows a pot in the microwave. Like, this bachelor doesn't cook at all. So, like, <laughs> I make sandwiches. Basically, what they had. I can make macaroni and cheese. Not well. <laughs> so, so basically, what they had Tim do was take huge Ace of Japonicum leaves and like put them in a pancake and just fry them until they were terrible. And then I had to eat them on camera and be like, this, this sucks. I mean, this is awful. And then, so then we went and learned how to do it properly. But uh, we wanted to include this because it was really cool. Uh, again, we're probably going to do a YouTube video about this at some point, but uh, gosh, I forget her name off the top of my head, but this lady's blown up now. She's been in... And her son's in Florida. Yeah, yeah. Did she pet you? No, no, she no. Played it off on the bus. <laughs> Super cool though, and she included talked to us about the type cultivar she uses to prepare the really? foliage. It's a very specific leaf, like they only use yellow foliage, and um, we, we looked at some cultivars that would be very similar to what she used, so we could start trying it out a little bit. Next time I go back, I'm gonna see if we can't go visit her and collect seeds off of hers to bring over and be able to do some tempura over here. Super nice lady. Her, her, I'm sure you saw it on Facebook. Her, uh, her YouTube story has went like viral a million times over. So we also, everywhere we went with the TV show was in peak fall color. Um, and they would call ahead and they'd say, what's the fall color like? And we'd go there. <laughs> you never get a better trip than when you go to the TV show because they scout ahead I don't know, yeah, it's not good, we're not going there. So like they would keep us in suspense about where we were going. So when we showed up, we were like, wow, you know, blown away with it. But this is at the Kyoto Botanical Garden. But again, just some of that contrast you can have with uh, with fall color and color explosion going on. This is uh actually didn't put me close at Giko Alley. And uh, this is uh Icho Namaki Avenue. It's in Tokyo and it's amazing. The Ambiance is just everything's yellow because they have streets lined, perfectly manicured ginkgos, all shaped the same way, bright neon yellow fall color. Forty feet tall, all of them are like perfect little pyramids. They, they block off the streets for time for periods of time, and they say, "Everyone, go take photos." And then everyone takes photos, oh, and great. then they say, "Get out of the way!" We, and then blow the whistle, and then the cars start going back to the middle again. We braved the bus system to figure out how to get down there on our day off again to do the this. Train. The train system, yeah, the train system, which is much trickier than uh, the bus system. But I so, would rather drive. It's much easier to drive easier to Japan than take the trains. So we figured all that out. We got here and then like the traffic is like, you know, it was like five o'clock Raleigh traffic when we got there. And so we're like, what gives? Like, the, we're never going to get a picture of this. Like, you know, it was five lane traffic, just downtown Tokyo. And then a whistle blows, literally. People drag out a bunch of barricades. 15,000 people get out on the road for 30 minutes and then a whistle blows and they move and all the traffic goes again. And they literally bring their dogs out there, it, set them on stools and take photos of them with the ginkgos and fall It's like the biggest holiday you've ever seen. It's like, it's like they were shooting music videos. It was kids, the biggest Kids holiday. were out there literally doing the party rock Yeah, dance. like people were shooting. It's like such a big party in the streets. It's crazy. And it was, it was just so much fun to see that. On the other side of things, that was the ginkgo party. The maple party we saw was at Karanke. And they take all their ginkgos and hit them with yellow lights. So these are in perfect fall, maple's in perfect fall color. Everyone's going to take in fall colors. And then it gets dark, and then they light up the forest. You couldn't talk about yellow. color explosion without including this part of it. It was really hard to photograph. Again, I, I might have talked about this to you before if you've ever seen some of our talks, but this is how much of it made it into the TV show. Like this was there, and I'm like, and so we went like seven hours to get to this place to shoot this, but that was all made on the TV show. And there's probably, gosh, 20,000 Japanese maples along this embankment. And you come across this red bridge, there's probably 20,000 trees, and every single tree has yellow underlighting. And then in the middle of the reds, yellows, and orange fall colors. And so the whole forest is like on fire. It, it's amazing. That's so cool. Our dream is to one day maybe recreate a little something like that in one of our new display gardens we're working on. And they light up the walkways with little uh, candles that have little maple leaves cut out, out of the candles or out of the candle holder, so you can it just looks like little maple leaves everywhere you walk. One day when you come to Hendersonville for the uh, the apples during fall, maybe we'll maybe we'll have something for you to come through that, <laughs> that uh, will maybe not mirror that, but have something like that. So uh, I guess we're to questions. Where in Japan was the was the maple? The it was in Karanke is the name of the city. It's it's, but southern between Osaka and Tokyo. Cool thing. It, it closer towards the end of the show, but it was 
I'm glad they, they took us there and <laughs> waste all that time shooting, I guess. Uh, we shot hours of video just walking around looking, you know, into this color because that just kept going. I mean, it didn't end. Like, you just kept walking through glowing forest of Japanese maples for, for a long time. Any questions about maples or? I know we went through a bunch of cold bars we, uh, we and then we talked about Japan, so. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, how do they do with uh, ground colors? Uh, we've got one area that has Vinca Minor growing into it, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm afraid about the root structure competing with it. You have to be careful with anything that has, uh, you know, Japanese maples have a very non-invasive root system. One of the reasons we're able to put, in, in like those pictures you saw, you can have a ton of Japanese maples in a small area because they don't compete heavily for roots. But as a result, you want to make sure you don't put things around them that have massive root systems. So at a, at a younger age, Vinca might be a little more aggressive. Something like a sedum may be a little softer for it. But as the tree ages, like our display garden, if I, you were there at the open house, you'll notice we have got actually different varieties of Vinca around some of the larger trees. But we didn't put that out until the trees had already had a nice size caliper to it. And it wasn't going to be affected as much by a smaller Vinca plant. Those aren't terribly, uh, you know, like invasive for the roots. You got to be careful with some things like Japanese yews and things like that. You'll see people build a container garden and they'll have a really nice pot. They'll put a yew in there and the yew will take up 75% of the root space in there and only be, you know, very small, but the root space is huge for it. Or, or, or some tall grasses. Tall ornamental grasses you may need to be careful adding, especially to confined spaces, things like that, because maples are, are not very invasive at all in the roots. And they're very well rooted in, but it's not something you want to give a massive they, amount of competition to. Yeah, they definitely don't want a lot of competition, especially at a younger age. Uh, as they age, they, they, they're more uh, resistant to plants trying to compete with them. Um, but at a, at a younger age, you definitely want to put a bunch of ditch lilies or something right at the base of it that might root out some of the younger plants. Yes? Spraying protocol for fungus. Spraying protocol for fungus. Um, Honestly, we really don't have too much of a fungus issue. Light, um, insecticidal soaps work great. Um, early spring works better than late. Most times, I, most times, especially this time of the year, like small damages like um, powdery mildew and things like that have already ran their course, and so you want to catch them early. Things like um, basic insecticidal soap so it can help kind of limit that powdery mildew buildup too. The, the most light fungicides that are are rated for maples should be fine. To be honest with you though, fungicides and strong insecticides and things like that of nature are things that we actually have a lot of less experience in because we don't have that many issues where we're at. And when we don't see there's a big issue, we don't treat it for fear of, we've got a, a very large creek behind our house we don't want to affect any of the ecosystem. And so we're very, very minimalist when it comes to putting out a lot of stuff. Um, but I believe there's a number of, uh, just look on the, the label and see if it's labeled for ornamentals or maples. Um, and most fungicides will knock out uh, something like uh, the powdery mildew. But are you talking about another type of a fungicide, a fungus, other than powdery mildew? The leaf spot. Now the leaf spot's a different, a, a different thing. Most of the leaf spot is actually taken out by insecticide. Because what you're seeing, the leaf spots are the results of leaf hoppers. That are, small are, that are li running around and hopping, laying their eggs on the leaves, on a lot of Japanese maples, and then those eggs hatch out. The leaf hoppers are also carry the fungus with them. So if you're treating, if you go and, uh, if you treat for the leaf hoppers, you don't have the issue with the, the leaf spot. Because it's the leaf hoppers that are actually doing that. And a lot of people will think that's a number of different things. I've heard from, most people think, I watered this and it's in the sun, this burnt. Mark, Mark actually had a really good study sent me on it last year. We're, we've had more of it here in the south than, re, than in years past, but it kind of just looks like little bullet holes. And it's, uh, it's not something that's going to cause long-term damage in the tree, but it kind of just makes a little circle. And for the longest time, we were puzzled by it. I, I sent a picture of it to Mark, and that's probably about like four years ago when we first noticed it. And it's conditional, so it's not something that's going to affect the tree long-term, but so it certainly it, can make it look a little less desirable you know, so for that season. But if the best way to deal with that is mid-spring. Before you start seeing any damage, treat for the leaf hoppers. And if you treat for the leaf hoppers, which are just the little teeny tiny, sometimes uh, look like little small little leaves, little grasshoppers, you'll see them, you'll touch them, they'll jump around. They're actually carrying around a lot of the fungus that's spreading around. But it is mostly conditional too. You'll notice some years 
the, the, the truth of it is, by the time you notice, it's normally too late. Yes? I know a lot of the maples you can keep in pots and even root pruning to keep yeah. it. Well, they will kind of do like goldfish too in that they will stay smaller in containers. I mean, certainly I've seen autumn gold, which is typically gigantic, done into a bonsai style and kept very small for a very, very long time. And so they will stay smaller by being kept, you know, confined like that. You'd have to root prune it and lightly reduce roots. Uh, typically we do most of that in like late February to early March kind of time frame. We'll but geckos respond very well to container culture especially if you can do some root pruning during the winter. Um, now, there's certainly several cultivars you can pick too. You know, same root system, so it's the same philosophy, but you can pick certain cultivars that will stay very small, and so it kind of lends itself easier to it, so you're not trying to play catch up as much. But I, whenever you root prune, still remember that those, those pots need to be a little more alkaline. So by giving them the lime, that'll allow them to fill out and make a nice dense tree and have strong growth to them, but you can still keep them smaller by doing those methods. You probably heard this joke. I probably told this one before, but this guy called me yeah. and he said, I've, I've squeezed the lime all over the ginkgo shell <laughs> in, in there as well. So sorry if that was you, but if you say something that funny, I'm going to mention it in all my talks for forever. Because I'll laugh for five minutes on the phone before I realize he wasn't joking. <laughs> yes? Um, for the Piedmont area, what's your favorite recommendation for a dwarf yellow? I would probably say the summer gold. Uh, you know, it's the smaller of the yellows. There's but, certainly a lot that can handle it, but and that's for one that's going to be able to handle more sun. Summer gold's typically only six, seven feet, even in 20 years, so it stays relatively small. But it, it would be it would be my pick for the brightest yellow, but also the smallest. And that's for being able to handle the sun. The Dragon Master and Golden Falls. Probably you need to give them a little protection by after the sun. But they're going to give you amazing weeping habit. Yeah, and those like to be smaller color. long term. Yeah, unless Let's you stake them up really tall. Have you guys ever had any ambrosia beetle problems? We haven't. We've been very fortunate. We don't we don't have them up there, but uh, yeah, uh, those are scary for sure. We always kind of sweat it a little bit when we see <laughs> pictures and outbreaks and things like that. I know someone in the Wake Forest area had problems with those. Areas. I didn't know that. Nothing that we've had in our area, so we we just yeah, hope that we hope we hope for another cold winter that knocks them, keeps knocking them back. <laughs> that's that's kind of the thing that does make me smile when it's a little colder. Some years I'm I'm hating it, but I'm like <laughs> maybe no keep, fire keep answer. Nasty. <laughs> trick we learned from friends in Japan. They were throwing it on there. And you'll, you'll read online, people will say geckos are slow growing. Other people say they're fast growing. Well, the difference is the alkalinity of the soil. And it's such a difference, but my question is, do I need to add that every year? And then how often do you need to root prune if I do want to kind of keep it in a container? Sure, you can. Uh, the, the answer to how frequently we do it is very. And so like on a one gallon, we'll hit them in the spring, like March. Uh, we'll go back, we'll do more lime in the midsummer, uh, typically around now, and then we'll also lime them when we pot things up in the fall. So a lot of things will be going from ones to three gallons. We'll lime them again in the fall. Some of the trees have been limed three times before in one season. Not something you have to do, but it's also not something you have to be that worried about. It's not going to really, it's hard to overdo it is the answer. I'll put something like three tablespoons in a three gallon. And so we'll use a, a high level amount and uh, the growth is great. Uh, not something you have to do every season. But you certainly will get results with it. And if you're cutting back that foliage too, you'll notice the caliper will thicken up immensely that way too. And so Especially you'll, create a, you'll get a large caliper by lining going into the fall. You don't have to, but if, you, if you're going for a, like that aesthetic in a container where you're trying to keep it smaller, by doing that you will thicken the base up a lot too. So in, in ground, do you, you, you keep doing it every year kind of thing? You don't have to, but you certainly can. Like, I, I like typically if, do it for the first two or three years. And that just lets the tree get its motor started. And once it gets its motor started and the alkalinity of the soil is kind of uh, getting a little more alkaline, it, it keeps going. Okay. Um, the first year we tried it, we, we 
if you saw we lined any, the nursery out and we said this side's getting lined this heavy and we're just going pretty heavy with it and this isn't and then the changes within you know a short time frame were like wow uh, you know we should be doing this to everything it's but not start to see getting it, anything and it's making them really jump if you start to see your ginkgo slow down you want to keep growing yeah i'd probably throw some more line that because it's probably going to be one of the things that gets it going and it's cheap i mean it's something you can get three or four dollars a bag or if you want to make it a margarita just <laughs> <laughs> no don't do that don't do that uh, the leaf color for ohi sumagaki uh, on, the, on the website it didn't have the leaf color it will spring. fade to more green this time of season what it does ohi sumagaki will have that purple border to it so it's a if you're familiar with sumagaki that kind of that red fingernail look so it's a green leaf almost yellow early spring chartreuse with purple border around each leaf. And Ogi Sumagaki is a selection by our friend, um, you know, no, no, uh, Hisia Nakajima. Hisia Nakajima introduced that one. And what it's supposed to do is hold the border even more longer into the season. So it's a more elaborate border to it later. And this time here typically is mostly green, but the new growth will have that bright border. You'll also notice that Sumagaki needs protection from the hot afternoon sun almost even in the spring, uh, the Ogi Sumagaki will hold it throughout the season. And it will handle, a little bit more handle the sun throughout the season. Um, and part of that is, you know, it, it does grow to a darker green throughout the summer where the Sumagaki just tries to be a little more yellow green and just, it can, it can burn. Well, that looks like it for the questions. questions. How about if we uh, have the questions over there near the plant sale after we do our little plant giveaway. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt and Tim.